Welcome into the first edition of the Prowlcast here on the, the great wide world of the public internet. I am Ace Ford, back alongside my broadcast and radio partner, Big Kev Russell, reunited through the internet um, for what we're going to call the Prowlcast. This will be a chance for Kevin and I to keep relevant in sports with one another, and we'll talk about the, the um, pressing sports issues of the day. Uh, we tried this once. It didn't work out for some reason. Audio difficulties on Skype. So now we've switched to Facebook, um, although I think those two companies are still pretty intertwined, so it's not like we're dissing one for the other. But Facebook it is nonetheless. The Prowlcast, first official edition. Uh, it'll be a Final Four edition uh, because the Final Four is the most pressing sports issue of the day. Uh, not really an issue, but a you know, a, a fun time. And we had one, Kev, like I said, a uh, one of these that didn't quite work out. Um, but the teams that made it through mostly followed what we thought was going to happen. You were a guy, because we did over the Sweet 16, and you thought um, maybe Wisconsin would fall. They did not. Um, you were pretty high on Notre Dame getting Kentucky, which they almost did. Um, but we have the Final Four set. Kentucky and Wisconsin, a pair of number one seeds. Then Duke and Michigan State, the one-seven matchup. Um, and where do you want to start? Uh, I mean, I think you've got probably two of the best games you could want. Yeah. Four of the best coaches you could want. Yeah, I think the coaching is where you know it's a great matchup of coaches. I think if you're in the market looking for a coach, you hope that you're going to find the next Bo Ryan, the next Mike Shashevsky, the next John Calipari, the next Tom Izzo. Um, I think. That's what all these coaches are shooting for, um, is to be regarded as one of these four coaches and one of these four greats, um, all-time greats for that matter. Um, so I think what you're going to see is four very well-played games. Very rarely do you see teams coached by these four um, Hall of Famers or you know future Hall of Famers where they're not playing good X's and O's basketball. They're not playing fundamental basketball. Um which leads me to believe that what's going to win out is pure talent um, because I don't think any team has a coaching advantage. Um, I think the coaching is an equal playing field. So I think it then comes down to talent. And I think if you look at the talent, I think, you know, Duke is a clear favorite to me over Michigan State. Um, and then I think Kentucky has just enough talent to get by Wisconsin. So right off the bat, that's what really strikes me is I think these are going to be one – by who has more talent? I think that's Duke and Kentucky. I I, I like the um, I like the Duke pick. I, I think that they'll just be um, as you said, probably a little bit too much for Michigan State. And I agree with the, the coaching sentiment. I think you've got um, arguably. I don't want to say you know, Calipari certainly is probably the best college coach in terms of um, recruiting records, things like that. The last three or four years, so you've got probably the best college coach in the. Krzyzewski, obviously, with the most wins. Izzo, you could argue, is, is one of the best tournament coaches. Um, it's the ninth Final Four for Michigan State, and Izzo is, you know, fighting for his fourth national title, which if he got it, it would, A, be, you know, uh, kind of on the lines of how Connecticut was last year, kind of pointed from, you know, their butt. Well, actually, did you see that stat, Austin? Um I don't know if you saw it, but if you look at what Connecticut did last year coming into the tournament as a seven, their overall record, um, who they beat to get here, like what seeds in their bracket, and then the other two teams on the other side of the bracket being Kentucky and Wisconsin, it's actually a mirror image. I forget where I saw that post, but it's pretty scary um, if you look at what Michigan State is doing in comparison to what UConn did last year. It's very similar and quite honestly, I'm not a guy who's very superstitious, but it's pretty crazy, and I'd be hard pressed to bet against Michigan State with all the stars seeming to align. Yeah, and and very similar to, to Connecticut last year. It's a team that um, is more, I say more guard oriented, just because of the way that Travis Trice has played. And Valentine kind of plays like a he's a stretch three more or less. I mean, six five, six six, and then Brendan Dawson is your big guy inside, but. Uh, especially with how the Forbes guy has been shooting for Michigan State. They are a more guard-oriented team. You know, Calhoun last year, Izzo this year, they're two coaches that, you know, you'd be dumb to bet against. Um, and I obviously bet against both of them the last two years. 
Um, but it, it, the, the talent thing you mentioned is I heard a, a stat the other day watching the, um, the McDonald's All-American game is there are 18 McDonald's All-Americans in this Final Four, 17 of which play for either Kentucky or Duke. So that's where the talent is. And so, yes, on talent alone, those two teams should win. I think it's going to be Wisconsin and Duke in the final. I think Wisconsin is finally the team that has all the pieces. They have um, good guard play. They have legitimate size inside. They can shoot the ball. They don't make mistakes. They play as a team. They've got, you know, Kaminsky's obviously the guy that leads in most every category, but you know, Sam Decker could lead the team one night. Josh Gosser could lead the team one night. Um, Kaminsky obviously can do what he can. Um, you know, you don't know how much they're going to get out of Trayvon Jackson, but he's had, you know, now ample time to rest, and he's played in the last couple games. So um, maybe he will be, you know, an added bonus off the bench, especially as a guard. Um, I think that's our, obviously the best game of the night and probably the best game that we could have hoped for coming off that side of the bracket because a lot of people at Arizona may be getting there. But yep. I think Wisconsin and Kentucky just match up so well. Y y there's no real clear advantage outside of the fact that Kentucky Well, and, and I'll tell you, I was surprised um, that Duke actually opened up as a five-and-a-half – where it is currently now a five-and-a-half point favorite. And Kentucky is a five-point favorite. I think that's not giving Wisconsin enough credit. Um, I agree with you in that I think – Kentucky is more talent, but I think also Wisconsin does have all the things that are needed to beat a team like Kentucky. You talked about guard play, and then they have size inside. Um, I do agree that, you know, and I think we've said all along, all season long, all the experts have said it, Wisconsin is the team that matches up the best against Kentucky. And, and I think that's what you, you all you can ask for is that you match up well, and if you have a good day, that's all you can really ask for. If Kentucky beats you even when you have a good day, you'll, you'll live with it. They're just the better basketball team. And the one thing about Wisconsin is they, and I said this when we tried to do this first podcast, is they have the moxie and the swagger to kind of match the the, the behemoth of what Kentucky is. Because, you know, it, it in the games that Kentucky almost lost this season, they won those games because the other team kind of chickened their way out at the end. Um, and now, you know, Notre Dame is another team that had guys like Grant and Connaughton and Jackson – that had that moxie and that kind of, you know, assuredness about themselves. And, and they pushed Kentucky to the closest brink they've come all season. Wisconsin's not going to be afraid at all. They're, uh, coming into this game, they could feel there's much of the favorite as Kentucky. And you said the, the, the five or five and a half point um, line right now on the game. I think that is a bit high. Um, but it, it's going to be a great game. I think this will be probably the best game we're going to see of the three that we'll see this weekend, because I think the national title game, uh, it, it's always a, a pretty good game, but this is the one, the Kentucky-Wisconsin game. And I think, you know, by everybody talking about it, it's not going to give Michigan State enough credit for what they're due, because they're going to push Duke. But I just think Duke with Okafor inside is just going to be too much. Uh, they, Michigan State's really got nobody legit to cover Okafor for an entire game and, and and the guards for Duke are just playing really well. Right? Yeah, and I think if you look back to that Gonzaga game, going back to the Duke Michigan State game now, the Gonzaga game for Duke, you know, what really impressed me for them is their defense. I mean Gonzaga was a team that can really score the basketball, yet Duke held them I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the fifties. Um I remember, you know, a lot of people saying this was gonna it was gonna be an up and down type game, you know, 75, 70, something something score like that. Duke ran them out of the gym and played great defense all night on Gonzaga. Michigan State is nowhere near the offensive team that Gonzaga was. What is Duke gonna do to them? How many points can Michigan State theoretically score in this basketball game against Duke's defense? I just don't think, you know, Michigan State's been playing good defense all tournament. I don't think Michigan State can score enough against Duke. Yeah, th yeah, that's that's a good point. I think they haven't. Um, I mean, you know, they scored some points on a good defensive team in Virginia, but at the same time, Virginia wasn't making the shots offensively that Duke's gonna. You know, they. It's. It was a game they could score points because Virginia wasn't putting the ball in the basket, and so they got some early fast break opportunities. 
Michigan State's not going to have nearly those amount of fast break opportunities against Duke because Duke's going to shoot a good percentage. They always do. And even if they don't, they kind of have that quickness. And Justice Winslow is a guy that's, you know, end to end, probably as good as anybody right now in college basketball. And, and he turns a fast break opportunity for you, you know, back into a fast break opportunity for Duke because of his ability to trek back, you know, make a play defensively and then immediately start a fast break on his own. Um, it's interesting. I think if you look at the the pro prospects this weekend of guys that are playing, Justice Winslow in this whole tournament, he's probably elevated his stock the most. Yeah, I mean, I've seen him in, in some draft boards as high as number four or five. Yeah, he's he could probably be the best player coming out of this weekend, you know, and everybody would think, oh, you know, it's Okafor or – and Kaminsky's not getting a lot of talk, but Winslow could be the best. I just don't think Kaminsky's quick enough time, at the se- at the next level. level. I don't know about you, but I just don't think Kaminsky's quick enough to be a great NBA player. I think he's very skilled in the college game, and I think he can do some good things at the pro level, but I don't think he's got the pure athleticism that guys like Okafor, Winslow, um, Carl Anthony Towns, I, I just don't think he has the same athleticism. He's very skilled. Very polished, but I don't know if that leads to a great NBA career nowadays. He could be, he could be kind of Pau Gasolish, though. Yeah, no, that that's who I would compare him to, but I don't know if he has all of the same skills as Gasol. Um, obviously, he can step out and hit the three very well too, but um, we'll we'll have to see on that one. But I agree with you that I think Winslow has really elevated his draft stock. Yeah, it's, so it'll be a, a, a certainly a good weekend to watch. So. Um, so you said Kentucky and Duke. I go Wisconsin and Duke. Um, you know, do you think that these Final Four games, the the two semifinals, are going to be better than the championship game? Do you think? I honestly uh, think the championship game of Duke and Kentucky is going to be fantastic. Important. I think Duke and Kentucky is just going to be an all-out war. Um, I, so I I don't know. I think Wisconsin Kentucky could be a very good basketball game. Uh, I think it will be within five points, so it's going to be hard to top that. But I think Duke and Kentucky could be one of those all-time classics, very much similar to Notre Dame and Kentucky from last weekend. Yeah, so so we will uh, we will see how those go, um, and it's certainly it's just going to be a great weekend of college basketball. Um, let's kind of turn our focus here. Uh, big golf news, obviously today. Uh, Tiger Woods saying that he will play in next weekend's Masters. Um, for me, two thoughts, uh, well, probably many thoughts, but the two that, that pop in my head, good for the Masters. Uh, I mean, it's obviously great to have Tiger there. Um, secondly, you know, I've said it, I thought all year long that whenever Tiger was coming back that he was going to come back and play well, and he didn't, obviously. Um, but with how late kind of he's either how late he announced it, you know, played a practice round there on Tuesday. Um, you know, he wasn't going to announce it weeks in advance. Um, but it makes me think that he is ready in whatever way Tiger's ready. Um, and that he wouldn't come back. And even though it is Augusta and it's a course that he's come back before on short notice and played really well, you know, after his, um, you know, debacle with his wife the masters i think was the first tournament he played no it was and actually it's funny we were talking you know very last day we were talking about this i was talking with my parents and um our friend joel about it and it's kind of funny you know you think about it that's when he did come back so he always seems to find a, a, he always seems to have a flair for the dramatic now the thing for this time is is the reason he's coming back is having to come back is because his golf game is in shambles not because his personal life is in disarray um, Augusta is the course that will expose you if you are weak. Um, not being able to chip the golf ball around Augusta National is – you're setting yourself up for disaster. Um, I know he shot 74 the other day with five birdies um, at Augusta uh, with, tor- with tournament pressure and, and yeah. Jim Nance whispering in the background. Uh, that's, an 80, that's an 80 to an 81. Now, he could maybe get away. Now, if you think about it, a lot of those – at least – if I'm thinking correctly, around most of those greens, there's kind of a a graduated rough, you know. So there's there's room that he could putt off a lot of those 
if he's close, you know, c- close misses. If he's on the fringe, there's not a need. You to can't you can't hide a poor short game at Augusta. You just can't That's do it. You, it's it's known. What is it known for? It's known for its crazy greens. And if you're out of position, the crazy, ridiculous shots you need to hit to get up and down. He can't hit the most basic bump and run pitch shot right now. I, I just think it's I think it's crazy for him to come back with no tournament reps before it. Um, I would have loved to see him play this week at Shell Houston Open in a birdie fest where, you know. He's, his short game is not going to be tested a ton because, you know, it's, a lot of these guys are throwing darts at the flags. But just to have the confidence to come back out, hit a few easier pitch shots and work your way back. Because coming back and going right to Augusta is just crazy. Um, I've seen, you know, being, being at Augusta last year, I've seen what some of the best players in the, in the world were doing last year when they were playing well. Um, yeah. Watch Jordan Spieth chunk a couple, blade a couple, you know. Tiger couldn't get the ball to do anything what he was imagining a couple weeks ago, six or seven weeks ago, whenever it was that he announced that he was quitting. Um, yeah, I mean, have you ever? I mean, now I am a, I golf and you golf and and we both you know played in high school and some things like that. I mean, have you personally? I mean, I don't think I've ever gone through. I've never gone through the yips, period. I'm probably jinxing myself, but I've never seen, obviously, ever seen anybody gone through. No, you know, I, I actually, I'm, I don't know if I personally have gone through what you would call the yips. I've definitely had days where I'm like, I can't hit the ball for the life of me. Like, you know, sh- you know, the S word. I'm not going to use it. Um, but it's like for Tiger, like there, it's not like he's, it's not like all of his miss hits on chips are chunks. Some are chunks. Some are dead blades. Summer flubs. And, and, and that's what I'm talking about, Austin, is that he can't even play for a miss. You know, sometimes when you're hitting – if you're hitting your driver to the right, you just aim a little bit further left, you can play for your miss. At Augusta National, you can't play for a miss. Every shot has to be hit with precision. And if you're not hitting them exactly how you want to and you, you don't have control of your golf ball, you're setting yourself up to shoot – God knows what kind of number because one miss shot can lead to another miss shot can lead to another miss shot and all of a sudden you have an eight on the scorecard. Yeah, it's it's you know I maybe it's just my false hope of greatness still. Lies. You know, would I be surprised if he contends? No, nothing would surprise me with Tiger Woods, but the odds on percentages wise say he's not going to make the cut. And watch him. Prove us all wrong. Yeah, he'll probably go out and win it. But, I mean, that that, would, that, that's that golf. That would probably be the greatest single feat. In it would be his – I bet you he, even he would say it would be better than him winning the U.S. Open in 2008 on one leg. That is pretty impressive. But, I, yeah, I, th- I agree. I think it would just be the – arguably the – Because go- golf is a game played between the ears. And for him to come back after people saying, you know, his mental game shot, you know, he doesn't have any confidence – that would be more impressive to me than doing it physically because we all know how physically gifted he is. So he's probably more physically able on one leg than I am on two. So that, that is, that is true. That is true. Um, and finally, we'll just, you know, wrap it up with a, a going back to college basketball, just something that pops my mind. I figured we'd talk about it for a moment. Uh, Shaka smart signing a seven year, I think $3 million deal with uh, the university of Texas to take over their head coaching job. Um, you know, other mid-major coaches in the past have been rumored to move up. You know, it was Brad Stevens. He went to the NBA. Greg Marshall uh, is staying in Wichita State. Um, did Shaka make the right move? Is now the right time to go to Texas? I mean, ar- you can't argue with the money. Um, but it, was it finally the right time for him to to step on from the mid-major and, and elevate, try to get Texas back to a more winning style? Uh, you know, it's it, it'll be it'll be uh, wait and see because I think the Big Twelve is ripe to be taken over by someone to have someone step up. Could that be Texas? Absolutely. Um, Kansas has been good over the last three years, but or last twelve years, I should say, uh, with Bill Self. But I think there's room for teams to come in and make a name for themselves and get to the national stage again. And I think Texas is one of those teams. Um. But I think he had something special at VCU. Um, he was the man in that city of, of Richmond. Um, 
Texas is a football town. He's going to lose some of his luster down there in the uh, Texas area in the south, and it'll be interesting to see. But I think I think Texas will return to being you know an NCAA tournament team, a Sweet 16 team every year. Um, he'll have a lot more resources, so I think it could be a very successful. But I just think overall image perspective, I don't think people are going to you know be as enamored by Shaka Smart as they are now because I think what he did in Richmond was so special at VCU. Um, if he re- takes Texas back to a Final Four, that would be special, but they've been there before, and it's a f- in the end, it's a, football t- it's a football town, it's a football school, it's a football state. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's uh, you know a good move for him for the money, and I think... You know, yeah, I think at some point, you got to cash in on what you did at VCU because eventually, if you have two or three losing seasons... Then those six seasons of greatness you had kind of get forgotten. Yeah, good point, good point. And we will uh, end on that note. So the first edition of the Prowlcast uh, coming to a close. Uh, special thanks to everybody that um, is going to listen to this. And we, uh, you know, just it was a fun chance and a way for, for Kevin and I to kind of get back into the swing of, of talking sports with one another. We hosted a radio show for a couple of years and did a lot of sports calling of games and things like that. So this is a chance for... For Kevin and I to kind of get back into the grind of things, um, and, and obviously wanted to bring you guys along with us as our uh, devoted listeners uh, and followers. So uh, we'll be back with you hopefully soon. Uh, by the next time we talk, the national championship will have been decided. Uh, baseball season will have started. Mo- Let's go Mets! So we'll have a, and the Masters will have been decided most likely. So we'll have a a new bevy of topics to cover uh, in the next week or two whenever we get back on the airway. So for Big Kev Russell, I am Ace Ford signing off and saying so long from wherever we are across the great wide world of the Internet. This is the Prowlcast signing off. Happy Easter, everyone.